In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, last week in our reading, Jude called us to remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He pointed to the importance of knowing our faith and what it is drawn from. The apostles, whom Jesus called by name and sent out into the world with his life-changing message of forgiveness, life, and salvation, as delivered through his gifts of word and sacrament, well, those men hold a very important place in the history of our faith. Those 12 men, later accompanied by Paul, suffered greatly for proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. Their lives were dramatically changed after having come into contact with him, and most of them met death in a violent and untimely manner with the confidence that he himself had overcome it. Their lives stood up against the scoffers of this world who at times take their mockery of the faith in dark and deadly directions. So tonight, as we continue through the season of Advent, Peter writes to us in a way similar to Jude. He points also back to the apostles, himself being one of them, and to the presence of worldly scoffers who challenge God's word, who live against it, and who target those who treasure it and live according to it. Quoting them, Peter writes, they will say, where is the promise of Christ's coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For generations, beginning with the generation that immediately followed Jesus Christ's time here in this world, predictions have been made regarding his return. Last week in our sermon, we examined one that took place on a very small but also very local level. That took place four years ago and anticipated the end of the world before the end of that calendar year. But with each false prediction that comes and goes, the world gets more and more lazy about the subject. And we as Christians might too. It has been so long. Is he really coming back? When will he finally do it? Where is the promise of his coming? When the world offers up these thoughts and questions, at times outright mocking the certainty of Christ's return in judgment, as Peter and Jude warn us about, we are tempted to think as they do. In fact, not only think, but we are tempted to live as the world does in this. The influences of our broken culture surround us. We are challenged regularly when it comes to putting God first in our lives and to praying to Him often and teaching about Him rightly to our children. The decision to pursue ventures outside of church Sunday after Sunday is always near, be it taking the day off for more sleep or taking the day as a pursuit of some youth sporting event that years before never would have intruded on a Sunday morning. With Jesus' pending return more and more in the back of our minds rather than the forefront, the world beckons us to disregard those in authority over us, to downplay the very holiness of the life that God has given us, to embrace lust in its many forms, to take which is not ours as long as we think we can get away with it, to spread gossip and lies about those close to us, and to shamelessly desire the people or possessions that God has given rather to our neighbors. As we live in this way, following the cues of this world, we wonder along with unbelievers, where is His promised coming? That question may actually be asked physically by those who doubt God's Word, but it is far more common for the actions of those who deny its validity to reflect this challenge to it. God's good word, through which he shows us our sin and points us to our Savior, 
is hated by the world and by those who dread the judgment it describes. As God's people, formed by His Word, who have been shown the treasure it is as we live out the lives He has given us, we turn away from the scoffers and the doubters and instead turn to the clarity of the Scriptures. Tonight we heard some of our students point to the importance of our lives as believers looking different than the world around us. And the question, as we heard it earlier in our psalm, might have sounded a bit jarring. And yet it is one that shows that our words and our actions are to reflect God's light and God's love rather than what is popular or prevalent in our sinful culture. God asks in verse 13 of Psalm 50, Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? With this, we see his rejection of empty sacrifice and false praise. As the psalm goes on, God goes on to condemn those who find glory in sinful living. He describes it. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. Peter's words of teaching and caution continue after condemning those who behave in these ways that Psalm 50 describes, after condemning those who question God's coming judgment. He says, For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Peter now challenges those who challenge the unavoidability of the last day with a past judgment that God poured out. In the days of Noah, as you no doubt recall, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God blotted out all but eight people, and almost every living thing that breathes air drowned as this planet was covered with water. The destroying power of water is certainly seen in Noah's flood. And yet, as Peter shows us now, in the time leading up to Christ's return, the destroying power of fire is what now waits for this world. He says, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. We know, as has been clearly revealed to us through the Word, that the last day is drawing near, although we do not and should not claim to know when it will be. In our examination of this truth last week, we recognize the value in living each day God gives us as His baptized, believing, and repentant people while we wait. We can and must use the days we have in relaying the promise of forgiveness that comes to us in word and sacrament, around which He gathers us each week in worship. Peter reminds us, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all, things, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Those who live in this world as though this is all we have, those who hold on to their sin and beckon others to join them in it, those who challenge God's word and mock the notion of Christ's return in judgment, are those whom God places us around and uses us to redirect to the cross. 
That is an important part of what we do here at St. John's Lutheran Church and School. This is what your children are taught day in and day out in the classroom and here in our chapel service each week. We know that our Savior took on our flesh, and we will celebrate this truth in a mere 17 days. We know that He did this for us in order to undergo the wrath that God has against our sin. It was poured out on our Savior completely as He bled and died. And His pure sacrifice is what makes us able to stand before God as His forgiven people. The last day is coming, and as we examined this past Sunday, the brokenness of creation reminds us of this very regularly. But that day is one that we as believers need not fear. Instead, it is what we use to lovingly call others out of their sin. By faith, we can look forward to that moment when we will see our judge, the resurrected Christ, and he will take each of us and all who lived and died in the faith to the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So remember, remember this promise and live in the confidence that it gives you and share it. Share it with your children, with all others in your family, and with all those around you in both your words and your actions. Amen. We stand now together and sing our canticle hymn on page 934.